Aung San, then 32 years old, left a wife and three children, the youngest being his then two-year-old daughter, Su Chi. In 1950, more than 80% of Burma's land area was in insurgent hands. The insurgents, a collection of communists, Trotskyites, Karens, and bandits, totaled less than 10,000 in number. But at one time, they virtually paralyzed the new Republic of Burma. At the time of Aung San's death, Burma was a far cry from an idyllic, newly independent, democratic state. Even before his death, there were armed uprisings of different minorities and ongoing revolts, mostly directed against the dominance of the ethnic Burmans and Aung San's party. As a matter of fact, the country fell into a rapidly growing chaos, with warring groups everywhere and the highest crime rate in all of the former British Empire. And they were tearing this country apart Westerners who visited the country in the 1950s, after independence, painted pictures of total debauchery and lawlessness. In contemporary terms, Burma was a completely failed state. Finally, the chaos became so vast that in 1958, the government, if you could still call it by that name, saw no other way out than to resign and asked the army to sort things out. The military action was harsh but effective and order was restored. But, and here the story takes an amazing turn, after 80 months, the army handed the reins back to the politicians, voluntarily. General elections were held and a new civilian government took over again. In the West, the Burmese military were applauded and awarded with high decorations. However, the new civilian government let the country slip back into chaos and ethnic and criminal violence within a matter of months. At which time, in 1962, and now without being asked to, the military stepped in again. And so the junta was born. In the early 1960s, Aung San's widow was appointed ambassador to India and together with her then 15-year-old daughter, Su Chi, she moved to India. After the military coup of 1962, the former wife of Aung San stayed on as ambassador until 1967, when she laid down her job and returned to Burma. This time she moved without her daughter, who continued her studies in England, then worked in England and the United States. She married an Englishman, had two sons with him, and lived in New York and Oxford. In the spring of 1988, that is to say 28 years after she left Burma, she returned to her fatherland in order to reunite with her mother, who was seriously ill. The mother died in December of 1988, but in the meantime, large demonstrations in Rangoon and Mandalay had erupted, directed initially against monetary reforms. Su Chi decided to stay on. She now publicly stressed her background by adding her father's name to her own. So from then on, she came to be known as Aung San Su Chi. In the years since his assassination, father Aung San had become something of a hero 
despite his years as a Japanese puppet, and his daughter undoubtedly drew some benefits of his dubious fame. After a fiery speech at one of Rangoon's most famous pagodas, Tzu Chi became a figurehead for the opposition, and she became rapidly well-known under her new name, Do Ang Su Chi, in which Do is to be understood as a reverence, a respectful prefix meaning something like a polite aunt. The military leadership was not very happy with the public performance of Aung San Suu Kyi, and she was placed in confinement in the villa where her mother had lived until her death. Although this restricted her movements, she was still able to receive guests in the villa and become the leader of the newly founded National League for Democracy. During the first general elections held in 1990, the NLD acquired approximately 90% of all votes cast. What happened next is little known, especially in the West. Aung San Suu Kyi was invited by the incumbent military government to discuss the immediate future. They made her an offer which seems hard to refuse. The NLD would get 75% of the seats in Parliament and 75% of the seats in the newly to be formed government. Moreover, Aung San Suu Kyi would be the leader of this new government. But the headstrong lady refused because 75% is not 90%. Obviously, this refusal was partly due to her lack of political experience as well. Anyone could have told her this was just an opening bid on the side of the military. And besides, this offer looked like a very good start for the first civilian government since 1960. But Aung San Suu Kyi turned down the offer right away and walked away from the negotiating table. An act consistent with her reputation as an unyielding personality. And maybe, just maybe, Aung San Suu Kyi who had been away from Asia for almost three decades, did not realize at the time that her behavior fell to the generals like a slap in the face. The junta declared the outcome of the general elections invalid, and Aung San Suu Kyi was escorted back to her mother's villa. Her confinement did not mean that she had to stay in Myanmar. She was free to return to her husband and two sons, but it was clear to everybody that if she went on a visit to England, she would not be allowed to return to Myanmar. Aung San Suu Kyi chose to stay, even when her husband fell seriously ill and died a few years later. For the people in her inner circle, the choices she made were not unexpected. She was known to be very headstrong and never one to be satisfied with a compromise. 
Do you have grandchildren children in the meantime, haven't yes. you? Have you ever seen them? I've seen one of them. Yeah. But the question, you know, the question is, is it worth all the trouble? Oh, very much so. It's worth all this and more. As one of her former associates in the NLD said, she always chose the tactics of the revolutionary and not the politics of the possible. And this lady does not like to be contradicted. It is obvious that the way she turned down the offer of the junta to lead a new government would lead to a growing discontent within the NLD. In the years to follow, many former members of the NLD would turn their back towards politics and Aung San Suu Kyi. In 1995, the junta set her free and immediately Aung San Suu Kyi grasped this opportunity to call for an international boycott. Sanctions are not really an economic weapon. Their aim is not something economic. It's sanctions were instituted, instituted for political reasons. She spoke out against foreign investment, against tourism to Myanmar, even against aid from foreign NGOs. Under indignant American leadership, the West started a long-lasting boycott against a rapidly impoverishing country. Again, she was confined to her mother's villa in Jiangon, this time under more strict conditions. This confinement lasted, despite international protests, until 2010. It might be interesting to take a better look at Aung San Suu Kyi's call for this boycott. She told the world over and over that democratic reforms had to come first, the economy would come later. Not an obvious choice to everyone involved, at least not in Asia. Just look at places like Singapore and South Korea, countries that gave in the last decades of the 20th century priority to the economy over democratic reforms. <laughs> 